Welcome to Into Theology. Reverend Professor Ian Clary and I are continuing our study of the Summa. We're just going to talk about the five ways today. We didn't finish the question two <laughs> of book one, so we're really just moving along fast in our study of the Summa. But I have the feeling that we're going to slow down a lot, especially, I suspect, the whole time. <laughs> I think so. I mean, there's just... That, that's the thing. He's so he's so concise with his words, which means that each sentence, each paragraph is just so loaded that you can just you can spend so much time just thinking about, you know, one of his answers to an objection or something. And there's just so much there that I mean, I, I could see us being in this for quite a while. We have, we have to probably be careful. You know, I mean, it took us, what, almost two years to get through the Institute. So, yeah. No, that's good. And I think after this, I'm going to go for a swim in the Tiber and yeah, let's do it. Get my feet wet get a our, little bit too. Get our pointy hats on and pointy hats. Smells and bells. Um, I, you know, what's funny. I, I'm actually most, this is weird to say because, um, but I'm most excited about the moral theology section. Yeah. Um, Not, not because it's necessarily more exciting than the doctrine of God, but I'm more familiar with this stuff and the moral theology stuff I'm less familiar with, but I also think that it's, much more important today practically because we sort of know the doctrine of God still we've inherited it okay but the moral theology stuff it seems like it's virtually evaporated well that's the argument of um it's that Notre Dame scholar virtually virtue. evaporated. they've evaporated yeah that's the well, you said virtually this time. I was making it oh time. virtually yeah I like it because they couldn't you're right they can't yeah it has to be virtually or mentally no, that was good. Thanks for that. Alistair McIntyre is what I was thinking of, though. His book, After yeah. Virtue, his yeah. whole argument is that they have, in fact, disappeared. We just haven't recognized it. And I think he's probably correct. And therefore, we have so many just basic moral categories that we are incompetent at. I think I'm most excited for getting into, like, what's, you know, the, the so-called treatise on human nature in the Summa, where he just kind of goes through what it means to be a human person talks about the soul and the body and the faculties of the soul i find that stuff really interesting it hel helps me understand myself better and uh yeah number one dad that's you yeah. and uh and then um i i just you know as i'm, I'm like we're about as i've worked through that section before you're like wow like this is just so fascinating that this is actually what it means to be human and what it means to be me and to be a self and that that also um you know, the things that he has to say there has direct bearing on so many of the debates about what it means to be a human today. Is um, that the um, body and soul section, like chapter five, yeah. essentially, in our book? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's referred to as the treatise on human nature in the cinema. Um, Great. But it, it's good. It's so, He's so good on that. I may have never read that before, to be honest. I'd have to look. Because okay. I haven't read, this, I I haven't read every word in the Summa. Yeah, right. I, I kind of use it more like a reference, you know? Me too, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's the whole question of hylomorphism versus substance dualism and Cartesianism and all that kind of stuff. Like you can get into this. It's a lot of fun. So. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But we do have uh, four out of five ways left. We've only talked about <laughs> one way. Yeah. And with Aquinas, it's not one way or the highway, but it's all the ways. Five. Yeah. Five. About the one way. Jesus. <laughs> well, I'm a youth pastor today. Oh, gosh. You look like it with your beard there. <laughs> Cheesy sweater. Yes. Okay. So the first way, can you quickly summarize the first way that we covered last time? Yeah. So while well, we looked at kind of in, you know, the, the other issues in question two about God being known by his effects, you know, is he known self-evidently? Yes, he is himself, but we have to know him through his effects, us as humans, uh, just because of our, our, uh, our creatureliness. And then, uh, you know, he gives these what are called demonstrations uh, that are, uh, that, that demonstrate that God exists as, as in the proper science. And then he gets into these five ways. And so the first, they're all like, they're all very much, I guess you could say the first four of the five ways are kind of like cosmological arguments. The fifth way uh, is a teleological argument, um, which, I mean, they're related. I don't uh, understand those fancy words. You must be a PhD, but uh, <laughs> someone like me, grass of the earth or whatever. What's cosmological and teleological mean? Well, a cosmological argument are usually arguments from some sort of cause and effect. And then a teleological argument is an argument for design or purpose. And uh, so you can really sort of understand the five ways of being like one argument with like five graded degrees, you know, that get kind of right. more and more specific. 
Um, so the first one is the idea of, of, you know, he argues for this, you know, kind of following along Aristotle, uh, the notion of an unmoved mover. Right. So because you have change or motion uh, that's observable, you know, as an as effects within the world, and if we know God by his effects, we can argue back to the existence of God by the observation of change, right? So something has to be moved. Uh, a, thing, a, a thing is moved by something outside of itself. Uh, you can't have an infinite regress of motion, you know, so the idea that like you just have all these like secondary movers without a first mover is impossible. So for it to be a, a first mover, it, it itself has to be unmoved. And so uh, you, you get this uh, this idea of an unmoved mover. He, he, uh, he says that this is the most manifest or the kind of clearest of the five ways. Um, and we noted how in the last episode that that some people who criticized Thomas on this think that you know this idea of divine immobility means that he's this static being that's unapproachable kind of aristotle's you know god um and then i gave a quote by garrett goulagrange basically saying that no god is actually his own activity it just means that there's nothing outside of him that can promote motion within god he is the source of his own motion and so it's not that he's unmoved in the sense that he you know you can't relate to him he's actually pure activity uh but john webster when he defines God's aseity, yep. says that that means that God is full and abundant and overflowing life in himself. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's almost the, the opposite of our impression given some of the language used. Um, but yeah, but here I think we're, everything's in motion. Even if I'm sitting here, my heart's beating, blood is pumping through my body. My brain oh, is we're, somehow we're behind the scenes behind. causing me to, to breathe as it were. When I think about all that I am, we might say like there's something like a soul that's in me, behind me, my mind, whatever term you want to use. There's something animating me. Even though I'm just sitting here, I'm never not in motion. My, I'm always yeah. aging, changing. My hair is growing at a, a very slow pace, but it's still growing at all times. And so everything sort of um, is moved, as it were, is in motion, as it were. Yeah. So eventually there has to be something that put it into motion. And that is what everyone assumes to be God. And uh, he can't just be some immobile thing, because if he's the first mover, he can't just be in a state of not moving. And then suddenly something causes him to move. He's always got to be all move all the time. And, uh, you know, that's a, maybe a dumb way to say it, but that's basically the argument. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, and and for him to move, he has to be in a state of, of act is the language that gets used, right? A state of being. And so God himself is described. You right, And that there's a reference to uh, Exodus 3.14, right? As uh, I am who I am. So God's in a, he, is, he is pure being. He is existence itself. And, uh, and so by being in that state of pure act or pure being, he can then move on everything else. And yeah, it's and, worth knowing uh, the context of all of this is in part, God's revelation of himself to Moses in the burning bush, Aquinas cites that to say, well, God exists because God says I exist. No. And he cites Exodus 3, 14, I am who I am. And that's a passage that most Christians have taken to mean uh, that God is what he is. He's he's existent being. He's something like that. Yeah. Because there's not really a definition of him in terms of our uh, human characteristics. He just is. And so he's he's taking it that way and then trying to understand the ways in which this is true, essentially. Um, the second, second way... Oh, go on, sorry. Okay. Uh, we're being polite Canadians here. Pardon me, young sir. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, go, go to the, let's go to the second way because we kind of... We can always go back to the first whenever, but... So the second, well, the second way is, is so similar. It's so similar, yeah. It's, it's about efficient causality. And... I, oh, I know the one thing I wanted to briefly mention was that... We, we, He's talking about actuality and potentiality. It might be just worth saying what that is. So basically, a lot of people try to figure out how things change in history. And like, what's the simplest scientific language you can use? And Aristotle was like, gee, I think it's really easy to say things can be something or they are something. That's the simplest way to talk about stuff. And everyone kind of agree that's the simplest way. Instead of having a thousand different words for everything, these are two words. You can be something or you are something or you possibly can be something or you actually are something or you are something in potentiality or actuality or you know and so on and so being becoming. so you yeah can, being becoming something that's in a state of potency or potentia 
has the potentiality to become, you know, to move into a state of being whatever it is. And so uh, that the, the language itself sounds weird at first, but like, oh, it's a state of actuality. Well, it's actually what it is, you know, is how you can think of it in a colloquial way. Like I'm in, I, in potentially I'm an NBA player, but actuality, <laughs> in actuality, I'm not. Well, and then what you need is you need a, a cause to actualize that. Right, you. something needs to actualize that. <laughs> Some sort that. of efficient cause. Yeah, and but the efficient cause did not make you tall enough. <laughs> basically, the language is a bit odd because it's just like scientific language today. If you went to a genetic scientist, they'd have all their jargon as well. Yep. This is basic language to describe how anything in the world can change. And it's basic scientific language that people knew at this time. And it it's it's the same thing that we like if you ever talk, if you just use the word gravity today, that's jargon. But we all know it. Gravity is a force that essentially pulls you down to its weight. That's probably not quite accurate, but you get my point. Like, yes, jargon that we all sort oh, of know. Your, what physics, it is. your physics here is blowing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever had physics like me because it's chaos and stupid. But but sometimes you read this and think, oh, this is weird language. But you're like, okay, but at his time, this is the this is normie speak for scientists or or whatever. Just like we talk about gravity or black holes or quarks. We don't always know all the details of it, but it, it's in our cultural lexicon. And uh, if you know that, then it becomes much just, it's just normal stuff. Yeah, he, here he's using the language, right? Speaking of causality, of an efficient cause. And that that's a, a term that when you first hear it, like, what the heck does that mean? But once you start reading both in philosophy and even in classical theology, you see that language all over the place. And, and in Protestant it, writings. Yeah, in Protestant theology too, it bears noting um and and here both in this and in the fifth way um he's picking up on aristotelian notions of, of causality right so aristotle i think it's in the metaphysics where he gives an example of what he calls four causes um that he illustrates with a statue and uh you know a sculptor that's going to make a statue and this is where the the language of efficient causality will come in so aristotle says there's four basic causes you have what's called a formal cause, material cause, efficient cause, final cause. So if you're thinking about a statue, the uh, the material cause is the block of marble that the statue is going to be made from. The formal cause is the idea, right? So forms are ideas. So the idea that you have, that this sculptor has in their mind of what this block of marble is going to become. And in a sense, you could say then that the it's almost like the statue itself is in the block of marble. Uh, as a, as the form is in the mind and the idea. And then uh, the efficient cause, which is what Aquinas is talking about here, is is the, the maybe the sculptor, his or herself, or the tools that they use that acts upon the matter to then bring about the statue out of this block of marble. And then the final cause, which is the fourth cause, is the purpose for it all, you know, to decorate, you know, a, yeah. uh, a front lawn of a palace or something like that. And, and, the, so, and the reason why material needs form is to make it intelligible. Yeah. Or else intelligible in the sense of like, you're, you're able to look at it, abstract, think about it, or else it would just be like guck. <laughs> like, or well, just be pure matter. It'd pure be, matter. I don't even, yeah, we won't even have a category to know what that is. Yeah, it's inert. It, that's why it needs it needs the forms and it needs an efficient cause to act upon it to bring about whatever it's going to be. And I also yeah. think it's important that again, this is Aristotle trying to be a smart guy to say, not only do you need potency and actuality to explain change in the world, but you need these four causes to basically understand anything. Like they they give you a summary explanation of anything, and you might say, well, I disagree. There's this or that. Well, that's fine, but try to actually just do, as a, an experiment, just think about this. Anything you can talk about, if you can name the efficient, formal, material, and final cause, yeah. kind of explained it. Who did it? What's it for? What's it made out of? And what's the idea? Like, what's its what's its stuff? What's its quality? And Aristotle uh, very yeah. famously said to know something is to know its cause. So if you don't under if if cause that this is the problem of modern philosophy when David Hume gets you know just you know this problem of induction destroys the possibility of knowing causality. Well, if to know something is to know its cause, and you can't know causality, you can't know anything. So th this is like, it's got like, there are major epistemological consequences. Of this. Yeah, well, Hume, I think everyone today who's in science kind of agrees, and maybe I'm mistaken, someone can correct me, but you basically just think there are things that repeat often if they're together, 
And therefore, you're, that's kind of an inference, but it's not really a cause because you've never seen a cause or effect. Those are beyond I eyesight and finger touch and smell. There are things that are like they're abstract or metaphysical. But since metaphysics are not a subject of study, but merely associations of things that generally lead to a, a result. At first um, and the big problem, just just really quick for real life that I find is that means you can never generalize because if you ever generalize, people say, well, you don't have the data or you can't. But you got to remember, uh, Aquinas believes in human nature. And if we all share human nature as a whole, we can generalize about certain things. Yeah. We can say we all, all of us go through the same kinds of temptation. And therefore, all of us can remediate that temptation through similar means. But a scientist today would say, well, no, because we're all so different. You need data, you need individual studies, and then you can infer something. So basically, we've lost the ability to generalize. Or in Aristotle's language, we've lost the ability to know anything because we can't know its cause. And so therefore, we're completely irrational in the technical sense, and we can know nothing. And you can't generalize about anything. Well, I just did, but you know anything. <laughs> follow those principles. Um... So yeah, so if if you take like if 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 in the order of four causes, if the efficient cause is the third, you know that that's what um, he's looking at here with the second way. So it's very similar to the argument about motion. So motion, it's un, you get to an unmoved mover, which he says is called God, and then in this one, uh, the second way, you get to an uncaused cause. So if motion is all about change, uh, here we're talking about the relationship between cause and effect, and he's basically going to say that they're almost like mirror images of each other. These two, the first two ways. Um, and just like you can't have an infinite regress of move movement and mover, you can't have an infinite regress of cause and effect. So if you, everything else are, are what we would describe as secondary causes. Um, but if all you have is secondary causes and you don't have a first cause, well, then you actually can't get secondary causes. It's absurd. So you can't have an infinite regress of cause and effect, meaning that you have to have a first cause. If it's first, it must then by definition be a uncaused. So there has to be this being, which, you know, when, when Aquinas will work through the various names of God or the attributes of God, uh, the, so for something to be a first mover or a first cause has to have certain qualities or attributes about it. It has to be eternal, right? It has to be all powerful. It has to be simple and, uh, and such. And so he's going to make this connection between these five ways to then who God actually is um, in terms of the attributes. Yeah, I'm excited, I think, in the next uh, question to talk about simplicity, because I think that's one of the most, what's it, unaffirmed doctrines. Most of us yeah. affirm it, maybe, generally speaking, but no one understands why. And Aquinas, I think, he makes it relatively plain. I think that he's maybe assuming a little bit too much because his audience maybe affirmed it easily, yeah. or we don't, but it's it's going to be quite helpful. Okay, so this third way is through um, is taken from possibility and necessity. Yeah, so the idea of a necessary, so the 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 realities of kind of like a contingent being. Um, so where are we here? Uh, we find a nature that oh, three. Sorry, things this. that are possible to be and not yeah. to be. So the idea of yeah, contingent being. So if there's if there's everything that we again, so this is looking at effects, right? And so if everything is doesn't have to exist right you this is what i tell my students like oh you're not necessary is that great you wake up in the morning you look at yourself in the mirror and you say i'm not necessary and uh, because we're not necessary beings we're contingent <clears throat> beings everything that we that is part of our experience doesn't actually have to exist mm -hmm. uh, it, it comes into being and then exits out of being uh but so the idea then for the third way is that contingent being requires necessary being for there to be contingent being Right. So he says uh, the third way is taken from possibility and necessity and runs thus. Uh, we find in nature things that are possible to be and not to be uh, since they are found to be generated and to corrupt. And consequently, they are possible to they are uh, uh, possible to be and not to be. Uh, but it is impossible for these always to exist for that which is possible not to be at some times is not. That's some jargon there or some convoluted language. Uh, therefore, if everything is possible not to be, then at one time there could have been nothing in existence. Uh, now, if this were true, even now there would be nothing in existence because that which does not exist only begins to exist by something already existing. So the idea is that, like, what he's saying here is that, you know, even the universe itself is not causa sui or, the, or it doesn't bring itself into being. 
from nothing, nothing comes. And so uh, the, the sheer fact that things exist means that there's some sort of necessary being out there that had to bring it into existence right. because contingent being can't be the source of its own existence. Um, and so uh, I, I, I find that one fascinating uh, in that, um, you know, uh, th- this, this necessary being has to be self-existent, has to be a say, you mentioned divine aseity. Uh, has to be the source of its own being, not the cause of its own being, but the source of its own being, which is what God is, right? That's that goes back to the burning bush. Well, yeah, and, and even all the Bible analogies that He is a fountain of abundant living waters of, of abundant life. Yeah, Jesus, God has life in Himself. Jesus says, "Yeah, I'm the way, the truth, and the life." All the analogies and all the created metaphors He uses to explain Himself. The burning bush is a, is a great example. But I even think like it's worth noting. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, good. Sorry. I was gonna say that, um, that jargon for that which is possible not to be at some time is not. It's not in a sequence of time. It just could be prior in time, in the future time, at any time. Yeah. So if something comes into being, it wasn't. It was not before it was. And if everything changes and corrupts, eventually it will not be. Yeah. Um, maybe that's not more clear, but to the point, no, you can I'm... read it as if, oh, like everything's here, but eventually it will will stop, and you're like. What does that mean? A rock? Like, yeah. Um, it's, anyway. it's, it's important here to note too, like the, 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 to affirm the creator creature distinction, you know, with this, because some people can read it as saying, Oh God is like, you know, the highest on the chain of being, uh, or that, you know, contend all these contingent beings, you add them all up and then you get God who's a necessary being or something like that. Like God is not, not of the same substance as us. So in terms of his being, like he, he himself is pure being, uh, everything else is continued created being. And there's distinctions there, right? That we that we have to affirm. Otherwise, you get like some weird chain of being stuff that um, can can destroy the creator creature distinction. And it's probably worth noting he's not doing this here, but the idea of God being the first cause and us having a contingent agency has nothing to do with there being like you said a chain or like a connection, like a a, a pull cue, and then he hits a ball, another ball. It's a completely different order of being a completely yeah. different order of cause, whatever it means for the, for God who is higher than the heavens and deeper than the depths to be the primary and first cause of all things all at once outside of time is so beyond our ability to name and describe that it can't be as simple as I'm holding a pencil. I drop the pencil. That's how God causes things. It's beyond any sort of material or physical or soulish causality. It's something unnameable, infinite, and beyond our comprehension. So I think a lot of people hear this kind of language, and then you're kind of like, well, everything's determined. It's all fatalism. But that's not the point. You you can't even name, like, yes, God is a first cause. You have to affirm it logically. And because the Bible says he made everything has providence, but you can't know what that means. And any human metaphor we use will fail because it, it all, it'll, in my opinion, always leads to fatalism. Um, I can't think of an exception. There might be one, but it all, it seems to always lead to fatalism when you use human metaphors. I mean, the, this is where the, the whole question of divine mysteries has to come in, you know? I mean, j- just think about it in terms of like God acted, like, and this relates really to the second way the, of the, fit, the, the argument for efficient causality. You know, you noted providence there. It's like not God not only brings everything into being as a first efficient cause, but he actually sustains it in its being. And so like right now, everything in this universe, including you and me, like our being is actively being sustained by God, which means that he is remarkably close to us without, again, obliterating the creator creature distinction. uh, We're not pantheists. And yet at the same time, our own being is actively being sustained by God's being. And so like the closeness of God is, I mean, he's, he's closer to me then my own body is closer to me, <laughs> you know, like, it's just, it's, it's, it's mind blowing to think about. I actually cannot wrap my mind around it. Um, well, um, just Hebrews one, three says that God upholds the universe by the word of his power. Yeah. And uh, there's other passages like that, that indicate that now in the present, the universe, the cosmos, the order of things is still held together by his control and that's not in opposition to nature. Um, it is nature. It is nature. Yeah. You could look at the earth 
and say it's orbit around the sun, you know, in 365 days and it's, it's um, twirling every 24 hours <laughs> is just a natural law. And, you know, whether God's in or out of nature, okay, that's fine. But this is some law that we're a part of. You actually can't think that way as a Christian because that is God's providence. That is God's fatherly care. He uses nature, of course. But it's one of the things that's really interesting. I'll just say this and I'll stop yammering. In the book of Kings, I'm, I'm preaching through it right now. And a lot of the prophecies for someone, and there'll be judgment against someone. When that judgment happens, it seems completely natural. So someone does something bad and Basha comes and assassinates him because he was, because uh, say Jeroboam uh, was a bad guy and then Basha is another bad guy. They get to fight and one guy assassinates the other. And then you see, thus the word of the Lord was fulfilled. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, but that's not like a miracle. And yet, no, that was God because he has ordered the moral universe to work in such and such a way. And if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And um, this is why Conan the Barbarian's strategy to maintain his rule is never going to work because he's going to get old and there'll be someone always younger and stronger. He needs to change the political structure of his kingdom so that he's not just a barbarian, but he can be a barbarian in his 60s and 70s and still rule because he has order and, and justice and law. And it's not just because of his axe and sword. <laughs> So that I take was your sermon illustration for no. <laughs> I just have really strong opinions on Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> You're a big Schwarzenegger guy. <laughs> uh, the, the the next way is moving along here is, is also related. <laughs> so, so I really, I really went way, with that illustration, did I? Yeah. If if the third way is about necessary being, then uh, the fourth is like kind of like a perfection like perfect being theology, you could kind of say, mm. right? So if they're degree, like what he's going to argue here is that, you know, you see this grid, what he calls a gradation that's found in things. Uh, the idea of like more or less uh, is predicated on different things. So you can have something that's more or less hot, more or less good, more or less cute, like the difference between you and me. And so in, in that sense, you have to be able to have a, to, to be able to make a, uh, uh, like more or less kind of statement like that. You have to be able to measure it against something that's the perfection of it. So if you can have more or less goodness in something, there has to be a perfection of goodness by which the more or less can be measured by. If there's the same with justice or truth or beauty or any of these kinds of things, and so that that means then that there has to be this this this, this per perfect being by which everything is going to be measured against in terms of that more or less. So he says, um, now the maximum in, in any genus is the cause of all uh, in that genus as fire, which is the maximum of heat, is the cause of all hot things. Therefore, there must also be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, goodness, and every other perfection. And this we call God, right? So you can see... You, they're all kind of very similar sorts of arguments, but he's taking different angles, whether it's motion, efficient causality, necessary being. Now we're talking about perfect being. It's it's worth mentioning. We haven't quite said this explicitly, but the word cause means nothing like the English word cause in the 21st century today. <laughs> okay, you can see you like <laughs> now the maximum in any genus is the cause of all that it, all right. in that genus. Like that's not how we think. A yeah. cause is like we drop a pen and we cause it to drop or mm -hmm. we threw it or something. A cause here is anything that sort of enables another thing. Yeah. So, you know, you might, like it's, it's much like a final cause is not how we think of cause or a formal cause. So, so the shape of a statue is a cause. So mm -hmm. meaning when you read the words like words, like cause, if you think 21st century definitions, which are, basically David Hume's and our subsequent thinking of that. We think of it in terms of efficient cause. Is, yeah, you know, we, yeah, we, it's, it's not that at all. There's, there's a bigger uh, thing happening. Well, I think that's the problem, right? In modern philosophy, especially after you get somebody like a Descartes, um, will will be the kind of uh, a key figure in, in this. But the idea is that we, that modern philosophy will retain efficient cause and probably material cause. And that's it. 
uh, but formal cause gets obliterated and final cause for sure gets obliterated. Um, if you read uh, Edward Fazer's, it's actually a really fun book. Uh, it's pretty easy to read. And it turns out to be kind of a history of philosophy, but it's this critique that he gives of the new atheism. It's called The Last Superstition, where that that's the big argument of the book is this idea that um, we need to retain, we need to regain and retain final causality, which is actually the fifth way. This is a nice segue into the fifth way, right? So because Speaking fin of final causality. Yeah, right. Well, final cause is the most important of them. It's this whole idea of purpose. Like what is a thing made for? And, um, you know, like the, the language of ends, when you think of like the Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is the chief end of man? Well, that's a final cause question. What is the chief purpose? What is our end? What, what are we, what is, what are we here for? And, um, and so the fifth way is, is right along those lines. He, he describes it as, you know, being taken from the governance of the world. So it relates back to what we were talking about with Providence a minute ago. And he says, we see things like Wyatt Graham that lack intelligence. Mm. <laughs> My slow soul. You got it. <laughs> You're, yeah, right. Uh, uh, but no, he says, you know, we, there's all these things out in nature that we see, what he calls natural bodies that acts towards an end. So you might think of like an acorn. An acorn acts towards an end of becoming an oak tree, but it's it doesn't have intelligence. It doesn't have a mind. And so why is it that it's always acting that way? Um, there's this design, right? Sometimes this is referred to as a teleological argument, and we can get we can mistake this for the modern uh, design arguments. You know, like Paley's notion of oh, I you know you find a watch on a on a beach and it's got you know all these like components that make it do something. Therefore, there must be a designer who designed it. That's different from this uh, fifth way, which is really the idea of like these inanimate objects that work towards an end that have to be governed by a mind. Um, so Thomas gives the example of an arrow, you know, so an arrow will make, you know, hit its target. The arrow itself doesn't have a mind. Uh, the, the thing that's making it move towards that end is the mind of the archer who's then going to fire it in a uh, in a bow. And so, um, so, so just like the universe itself is moving towards an end, meaning then it has to be governed by some sort of a divine mind that is making it go toward and, and that is, that has created it and governing it towards these, per, with these purposes in mind. You know, what's come, what comes to mind with these last two arguments, it might be a bit, bit of a silly analogy, but I think it's the Ken Ham ministry that has this whole argument about how the earth is the most perfect it's in the most perfect place in the universe to see everything and its orb and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's like it a reminded me a little, a little bit of the gradation argument and also a little bit of this argument. And you can still see how I know they're using different syntax and philosophy, but like this, what Thomas is doing is still what a lot of Christians do instinctively today because nature is wordlessly screaming that God exists yeah. and that he rewards those who seek him. And, um, but I think Aquinas to his benefit, to our benefit is summarizing some of the most important ways uh, in, it's, it's kind of wild that he does this in maybe a paragraph and you probably will do like a whole class on it, you know? Yeah, totally. You could easily. Yeah. I mean, I mean there's whole commentaries just on the opening of the Summa uh, that just goes in all, like I said, everything that he's saying here is just, it's packed full of good stuff. Yeah, um, like look at reply to objection one, you, you know, on 69, you noted this before we uh, we started recording, but like right there in very short order, he gives it and he addresses the question of the problem of evil. Um, you know, he just says that, uh, as Augustine says, uh, since God is the highest good, uh, he would not allow any evil to exist in his works unless his omnipotence and goodness were such as to bring good even out of evil. That's a quote from the Enchiridion on faith, hope and love. And he says, this is part of the infinite goodness of God, that he should allow evil to exist and produce of it good. Which there relates, it it's funny, everybody credits Alvin Plantinga in his book on God, freedom, and evil uh, that was published by OUP in, I think, like 1974. It's like, oh, he's like answered the problem of evil. It's like, oh, Thomas already did it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think we've, sometimes we forget about the medievals. Um, okay. He has something. What's the reply to objection to? Since nature works for a determined end under the direction of a higher agent, uh, God's a first cause. Okay, well, 
know. I don't know. That doesn't quite seem as profound to me. <laughs> I'll have to look at it again later. Okay, yeah, those I mean, are the just, five ways. <laughs> yeah, those are the five ways. I think like the fifth way is really great in that um, you know, it's a better design argument. So that's what the phaser in the and I think he does it in the last superstition as well. Uh, makes the point that uh, modern design arguments, even the intelligent design movement itself today that's connected to the Discovery Institute, which is, they do phenomenal work. Like I love what they do. Um, but they kind of tend towards a God of the gaps type uh, approach. And uh, whereas this one, it does, there's no God of the gaps here. It's like, you can't explain, nothing can explain why inanimate, unintelligent objects move towards ends when we know that that has to be done by a mind. And so, therefore, there's a mind that's governing the whole of the universe, right? And so, this goes right Which back into the idea a, of problems. Yeah. And what's almost Dude. hilarious is people say, well, no, that's nonsense because things follow natural laws, like orbits and gravity and all the, all the laws of physics. And you're like, uh-huh. That's the point. <laughs> that is the point. <laughs> yeah. Those things do obey certain laws and are always consistent. How odd is that? And, yeah. you know... Because basically, they're, everyone's looking for an answer in material causality, in, in materialism. And to be able to find an answer in matter doesn't deny God. I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah. You've just not gone, you just closed yourself off from the real world. You've named a part of the world matter. And so there's no, there's no, there's no God in matter. I can't find the God, was it the God particle? Yeah, As right. if you'd find like midichlorians or something. It's like, why would you? I mean, it's matter. It's just, it's like matter is the place where change is. So matter is in the state of becoming and God is being. So why would you? You would find him acting upon matter and, and matter and change and all that stuff is, is Thomas is showing but you. Shouldn't, even when you say God's God. acting upon it, like the way in which he's the first cause of all the natural laws isn't in a way that you would feel per se. It's like, yeah. it just is. <laughs> I mean, I guess you would feel it because it's everything, but you know what I'm trying to say? It's not like there's some, something special like God acted here, but not here because everything's the same. So there can't be, a you know, like, oh, the God for sure worked here, but not here. It's all the same. And that's all God. Yeah. It's just a different level of causality. And I think we don't think like that. And we don't think like that because, you know, the last 150 years has disabused us of the notion that there's something beyond what we see and feel and touch and hear and taste. What I like about these two, and I, they say, I say this to my students, is that they're just, you know, as you've noted multiple times already, like, this is just common sense. And so what he's appealing to here, these aren't like these crazy sophisticated arguments. You don't have to be a philosopher to employ them. Uh, it's just your observation of the world. It's like he, I say to my kids, it's like, hey, God exists because like, look at that tree over there, <laughs> you know, like, right. and, and intuitively, we just know that that's true. And he's just giving us reason to right. believe it. And it's important too. like he's writing for j basically educated people. And so the jargon he's using is available to basically educated people in the medieval world. Just like today, you'll teach a, an undergraduate class and you can mention weather patterns, gravity, physics, biology, DNA. Now, DNA would be such jargon to a 12th century person. Right. And yet for us, even if you're not an expert in it, it's kind of straightforward. And so I don't think you should be able to read Aquinas and think, oh, he's not speaking common sense because he's using words like final cause. Rather, it's just because it's not familiar to you individually. Yeah. That's the real problem. The problem is you, not Aquinas. Yeah, the problem is our lack of education, really. I mean, nobody, right. we don't teach philosophy in schools anymore. So, I mean, we don't even know. I have to like, you know, as I'm teaching intro to philosophy, I have to like lay out, here's the four causes. This is what Aristotle teaches about. This is what act and potency means. And you have to lay all that out. I, thankfully, I do it chronologically through, you know, from the ancients to the 20th century. So by the time you get to Thomas, you've had a bunch of Aristotle already. But yeah, people just don't know, you know. And anyway, uh, dude, I gotta go. Yep. Okay. Bye.